Yes, yes. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start the actual, like, I'm going to run through a presentation and uh, I'll be able to take questions and all that in a minute. Um, but first, while we're just getting underway, I want to introduce you to uh, my co-founder, Jamie Schwartz. Um, Jamie is another polymath. He's involved in a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, we met through Lunch Club about, uh, about a year and a half ago, a little longer now. He spoke at my Web 3.1 event, and then we just became very close friends and started finding all these similarities in the work that we had done together over the years. And, you know, that kind of merged together. And, and really, um, we landed on Team Flow because as we were using Fireflies and Otter and some of these other AI transcription uh, softwares, he and I were able to get in Flow and just riff off of one another at a level that I hadn't experienced in quite some time. Um, so that's where we actually said, this is flow. And then uh, about a month or so later, we discovered all this research from Jeff Vandenhout, um, who, uh, who put it all together. Um, so anyways, uh, Jamie, why don't you just introduce yourself briefly here at the beginning, give a little more background on your, your patents and the work that you've been doing as a brand therapist and uh, the, the, all, all the rest of us right now at least kind of know each other. <laughs> if we, we've all hung out in the same rooms and I think we've had meals together for the most part somewhere or other. Um, so, Jamie, please take it away while I get together here on the back end. Uh, sure. Uh, thanks, Chris. And hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jamie Schwarz. I, as Chris said, have been working with Chris for about a year on this thing that about six months ago became the Team Flow Institute. Uh, my background is as a brand therapist. That is a discipline I invented that came out of brand strategy after a background in psychology, advertising for about a dozen years. Uh, serial co-founder. This is number seven, I think, for me, um, and, and a lot of other product and business development kind of opportunities. Uh, the point of brand therapy is to create brand consciousness, to take brand strategy to that next level of brand guidelines, becoming something that's actually the voice in the back of your head. Uh, this requires uh, a lot of kind of thinking about a brand as a persona, as an entity that exists as the loudest, strongest ego in any room. It's the only employee that can't leave the company. Um, and then aligning that with AI, because now brands are literally speaking for themselves in chatbots. So even if the company doesn't realize that or the consumer doesn't even consciously realize it, it it's happening. But because of the discipline of brand therapy on the brand consciousness side is brand strategy and uh, brands consciously speaking for themselves, that allows a brand to sit for the first time in between product and market. So brand therapy is in the business of creating continuous product market fit. That has applied itself in a number of different ways in uh, building out team flow, as we'll kind of find along the way. I hope that's a quick enough introduction. Super quick, uh, and, and so much more that I, I won't be bothering telling you about today, but you'll be learning about over the coming weeks, everyone. I also just noticed that there's a bunch of people not on video, and that's totally fine calling in. Phil, Philip, thank you very much for calling from across the pond. Really good to see you here this morning. Um, Philip was part of the social business movement back in the day, and when I was looking for an old piece I wrote, I found something Phil wrote about it. And uh, that was very helpful. And I'm like, oh my God, we weren't connected on LinkedIn. Let's get that done here. Um, John Hartman, thank you so very much for joining. I really appreciate it. And Denise, um, we can stay afterwards if you'd like and talk a little bit more about some of those questions you had. Thank you for uh, getting in. And it seems you got into Discord. Uh, one of the very uh, difficult decisions that almost delayed me launching this thing for another month <laughs> because I was looking at pulling the whole community infrastructure and doing something else. Uh, but uh, we're moving forward now and we can change stuff together as we go forward. Um, so let me, um, as we're moving here into 1205 and we've got a little bit of a quorum together, a uh, bunch of folks, almost everyone who registered is here. Thank you so very much. Appreciate it. Um, especially given the little promotion that I've done around it. I'm sorry, every now and then you'll see me looking over at my second screen just to make sure everything's in place. Um, but I'll go ahead and share my uh, screen now to get into a deck so that we can, uh, you know, talk about this in a little more structured way. Uh, those of you who know me know I'm very unstructured sometimes, and one of the things I've learned over the years is how to get a little more structured. Um, I will tell you that Team Flow and the broader mission that we have is another one of those very hard things to uh, get underway because there's 30, 40 different ways to talk about this narrative and what's happening right now. 
Um, so we've really tried to focus it as best as we can on uh, the core principles of team flow to serve as sort of an aspirational state that we're trying to achieve when we're working together. And in pursuit of that uh, happens to be the very dynamics that are at play in achieving flow, as I'll explain to you in a little bit. Um, and we really believe that at the end of the day, the biggest benefit um, doing all these protocols, practices, rituals, and establishing these systems, the biggest benefit that it'll derive is a self-generating momentum when the team is really enrolled in the common purpose, um, shared objectives, and understanding and aligned with each other, having clarity, uh, and of course, deepening their connections with one another. And as we looked more recently at the you know, whole return to office argument, uh, there's a bigger thing going on there that you all probably recognize, which is a battle between the desire for autonomy and the management's need for observability. Um, we're not going to get too deep in that right now, but it's important to understand that's really one of the main things that we're, we're, we're fighting with. Um, but when we have enrollment, when we have people signing up and saying, I'm in, I'm going to do this, um, you get to this point of self-generating momentum because people are always looking for what is the next action? What is it that's required of me? How can I move this forward? And so that's kind of a simple headline of benefit as we've been defining it so far. Um, and of course, part of what we want to do is define it together. Uh, we have a lot of insights that we've gathered. We have a lot of insights that we've developed through our own experiences and from being taught by others. And we have a lot of questions uh, and hence the reason for making this an institute instead of just a professional services firm or something else. We need to come together to figure this out, to co-design the future that we're really looking for in terms of our organizations, our lives, and ultimately our society and economy. So some big uh, objectives and uh, let's get it started. Um, Summer of Flow 2023. Uh, no, that was not a chat GPT headline written for me. I actually came up with that very basic thing myself. Um, but uh, hey, it, it's summer of love, summer of flow, you know, 44 years later. Uh, or, no, it's more than that now, isn't it? 54 years later. Oh, yeah, 54 years later. My gosh, I should know because I'll be 54 next month. Um, but we're going to be doing these every week now, every Monday at the same time up to Labor Day. And then the Monday after Labor Day, we're going to announce the course and start taking enrollment in that course that we're going to be offering. we got a really, really interesting uh, approach to how we're going to do this course together. Um, anyways, we'll talk more about that in the coming weeks. Um, you know, what we're going to do here today is cover the basics, some of the practical applications for remote teams. On Thursdays in the morning, we're going to have office hours. Uh, I've already been asked and we will be hosting alternative hours as well so that we can meet people in different time zones and bring everyone together. I'll be setting those up over the course of the week. Um, really, who is this for? Well, it, it's for you if you're here, um, because we believe that the team flow facilitation, the provisioning or the acceleration of team flow and team cohesion um, is really a role. Um, and in it being a role, it could be a singular person who's responsible for enhancing and augmenting the collaboration of the team, or it could be a hat worn by a program manager, project manager, team lead, um, or, you know, anyone else really who has these sorts of skills. Uh, as I wrote about a month and a half, two months ago, and as I've been talking about for some time, um, I believe in the idea of a full stack project manager, one who's also a coach who's also a, uh, you know, a kind of learning and development expert to help people find their professional development paths. And indeed, most great project managers are, uh, but they don't necessarily always have the pastoral skills, right? The ability to really hear and listen. And today with all the work that needs to go into prepping for remote meetings, um, there's really even less time available to do all the different one-on-ones and all the other things that team leaders need to do and ensure clarity of communications and not get frustrated that two people still don't see eye to eye on something. Um, and then, of course, there's that bigger fun thing we all fight, need to figure out, which is how can we disagree um, but commit to moving forward? Uh, so we believe that the role of Team Flow Facilitator can solve all of that and 
that it's the opportunity to introduce the AI co-pilot for the team. And I, I don't like talking about the human as the co-pilot. I think the human is actually the pilot. Um, but the idea being that somebody who really understands how to clearly express the intent and needs, who understands how to interact with AIs and understands the different AI tools to accelerate different parts of our collaboration so that we can really get into momentum and do it. So um, that's a big setup to a lot of this stuff that's following. Um, before I get any further, Jamie, is there anything that I missed? Uh, I think I might say one word, which is going to be used later uh, here, which is trust. Um, the, the fact that we're really kind of relying on a hero to get this ball rolling of some sort of facilitator in, in the management role uh, comes down to this insight that we keep seeing again and again and again, that when a company finally just recognizes these people are here to do the thing they are trained at, trusting themselves to do, and instead of overseeing them, instead of not trusting them, but actually just seeing what they can do to empower that kind of situation already without any sort of team flow discipline that's been set up or anything that's made it into the system, because some of this stuff has, wondrous things happen. And we've seen these stats again and again and again, that when you switch from oversight to trust, that a lot of this stuff that we're talking about just falls into place. Now, the extra stuff that needs to get done, seeing eye to eye, moving at actually the speed of team flow and all that kind of highest level momentum, there's more to be done there. But just that switch alone is such an amazing difference. That's the one thing. Awesome. Thank you so very much, Jamie. Um, so who are, who are we? Um, well, I mentioned we're a research institute. Um, we're also an academy for education. We're going to learn together. I believe in learning cohorts. And so, Phil, I, I appreciate you wanting to jump in and start doing something along those lines. That's exactly what I'm setting this thing up for. Um, and seeing you step up and, and actually suggest one, I'm, I'm really grateful for that um, because that's what we hope to see a lot more of. Uh, you know, we're a community for practicing uh, augmented collaboration and ultimately um, providing it as professional services. Um, and in the long term, you know, I've been working on this idea that the 2020s would be the era of the guild for some time. Um, so I've got a talk out from my web 3.1 talk about building the big, instead of the big four, the big one. How do we all come together and, and create a values driven sort of consulting network? Um, there's several that I've been a part of over the last several years that have informed me, which actually led me to uh, talking to David Berkowitz and what he's doing with his fraction of a fractional uh, CXO network uh, to take him on as a pilot client to start implementing these principles um, so that we could actually have a real live environment to try this stuff out in, to learn from. And I got to tell you, every week there's something amazing that's coming out of it that like, there's one of our principles showing up and here's an intervention that we're going to now try to see if we can actually correct for it. And so we want to actually create a, a place where we're all able to try these sort of safe fail experiments and share the results of them. And so I'll be sharing more from what we're learning from the work with uh, David Berkowitz and FOF uh, into September once I can actually write some of it up as case studies instead of some of the core materials. But at the end of the day, what TeamFlow Institute really is, I hope, and that we're intending to, to manifest here, is to turn it in a cooperative owned by the members um, based on contributions. And how do we actually enable a platform cooperative to emerge here so that the value each of us puts in is equal to the value we each take out? Um, in fact, the value out even being greater <laughs> when we're doing it right. Uh, but let's get to par and then we'll go for our exponential returns from there. So what's the big, 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 big issue? Well, we talked a little bit about Phoenix this month. We talked a bit about what's going on um, in the world itself. Uh, we really know that it's time for us to do better because what's next uh, doesn't look so great in terms of the climate, in terms of our business environment, in terms of our society and our cohesion. And I believe that business is the engine for driving forward um, our economy and of course our, our societal behaviors in many ways. And so this to me is that inflection point where we can come together and do more. 
it's also, uh, as Jamie and I discovered as we were going deep uh, into this sort of launch and thinking about, you know, the, the story and the bigger picture that we're dealing with, a really important for moment for us to change before we can't. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, if you've gotten into artificial intelligence at all, you, you may have heard about human in the loop. Um, and uh, actually, Jamie, do you have uh, his quote ready? Or do you, I didn't ask you to do it, so forgive me for that. The, the, the quote from the uh, talk that you shared with me from the guy about business, the one that led to business, human in the loop, uh, loop collapse. Uh, no, but I'll have it for next time. Okay, good. Well, I will share that with you later because I just realized I should have put it in here now, but this is the first time trying to do this publicly. So bear with me, folks, I appreciate it. Um, what it really comes down to is this. Uh, artificial intelligence, if it just keeps generating on itself, um, will eventually collapse. It, it just becomes stupider. I don't know if that's what happened with GPT, you know, over the past couple of months or, or what's going on there. But um, what I do know is that if we add AI into business as usual, into industrial capitalism that's unfortunately largely based on um, exploitation or extractive methods of creating value as opposed to additive, um, we're going to end up with societal collapse. Uh, but if we can actually transform and get to a point of business as possible, doing the things we know are the right things for ourselves, for our organizations, and really switching it to this sort of win-lose mentality of a lot of corporations today, to generating a more win-win-win, um, we have an amazing opportunity to transition into business as possible right now, because everyone's going to be looking at what do I do differently? Unfortunately, we know um, we have uh, the human concept, don't make me think, in web design and elsewhere. So it's going to be a challenge to push beyond this somewhat which is why we really need to influence the leading companies, developers, and other people to adopt this approach to augmenting humanity instead of replacing it. So, but when we really look at the positive side of it, it really is magical. Um, I've mentioned, uh, you know, I've mentioned what we use with the transcript software with uh, Otter and Fireflies and uh, Phantom and so many, Fa I'm sorry, Fathom and so many others that are out there. Zoom has just added a whole bunch of fun stuff into it. And now even LinkedIn has some AI inside of it. So we believe that everyone is going to use AI in, in an everyday way, whether it's just getting some sort of simple output like a summary, or if it's something more deep like a prototype, uh, there's going to be a lot of interesting things in purpose-built uh, artificial intelligence applications. And there's still going to be a deep specialty in understanding how to orchestrate the team together and how to use these technologies to augment collaboration. So we're bringing together some neurological and human behavior, psych psychological behavioral principles together with this AI to approach it holistically. And that's where I think the real magic comes. And that's the sort of magic that uh, Jamie and I have experienced by this. <sighs> so before I go any further, what is flow? Well, you know, flow is this state of being, right? Um, and actually, uh, I can never pronounce his last name, and I'm going to be working on this so I can do him a proper respect. Um, Mihail wrote this book some time ago now called Flow, The Psychology of Optimal uh, Experience, Performance. There's so many different ways you can look at it. Um, but it's really this idea of being deeply and completely involved in an activity and reaching that clarity and getting enhanced performance because I'm all in. I am present, I am in this work, and I am continuously moving forward through it. Um, and what we look at it here for meetings, one of the things that happened with me regularly is that I would have to stop because I'd lose my thought and go, okay, what is it that we were just talking about? And we'd lose three to four minutes trying to get back into that. What was it that we were talking about? Or what was I trying to share? And how did I lose it? Because uh, as you go deeper in flow for ADD or neurodiverse people like me, a lot of tangents come up. And we think around different lines of questioning or ideas. 
and they just become too many. But with the transcript software, I've now been able to just roll backwards. And instead of losing our state of flow together and losing the progress that we've been making, I'm able to self-correct myself by looking at the transcript and going, ah, oh, gotcha, that was the point I was trying to make, and then getting right back into it. Um, right now, a lot of people think of flow as associated with an individual, but when we're looking at it in the context of a team, it becomes a shared experience and it deepens the connection and it increases productivity, which is another loaded word we'll talk about more over the coming weeks and really leads to a heightened collaboration. Now, as we uh, went deep in this, I mentioned we found a, a tremendous amount of work done by this gentleman, Jeff Vandenhout, who I've now connected with and hopefully we'll manage to do some workshops together in the fall and maybe a few other things, but that's still to be determined uh, and worked out since he's over in the Netherlands. Uh, and we're gonna be in the course this fall, really working off of his four main white papers. Um, as well as some other bits of work and, and of course going back into flow by Mihail as well and understanding that because really the first thing to understand in order to achieve team flow is the experience of flow for yourself and not everyone has had that so we'll talk more about that later although not in today's call because I'm trying to get us on a bigger picture uh, level for this first kickoff um, and in essence um, you know this lays down a more positive work environment. But of course, before we can get to that more positive work environment, we need to have a deeper respect for and appreciation of the human beings inside of our organization. We need to be concerned with their well being. And actually, with that together, again, is a key component of win 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 scenarios. And really, this other whole set of prerequisites. Um, and these are the sorts of things that got me really excited when I saw what Vandenhout was doing with Flow, because it all matches everything that we discovered, or I discovered rather, when I was working with Deloitte and left Deloitte to launch a software called Aligned uh, to try to keep people aligned. Now, I learned a lot of lessons from that. We'll talk about that later. But the deepest component, as, uh, as Jamie was mentioning earlier, is how do we create trust? How do we facilitate clarity? How do we get aligned on the same objectives and same interests and, and, and literally get on the same page? And how do we grow together? Um, which brings us to a whole nother concept of co-elevation, uh, something else we'll be talking about more in the weeks ahead. Now, when Vandenhout uh, described this, this is the model he ended up developing um, not right away, by the way, but after his first couple of years of research in this, that we needed these prerequisites as defined here, as you can see on screen in the corners, that the mutual commitment uh, to the work, um, to have a sense of psychological safety, which of course is also out of Google's project Aristotle as a core tenant of good teamwork. We also have to be aligned in our personal goals. So that means we need to understand that somebody is not trying to cut us off at the knees. We need to have that level of comfort and safety. And then an understanding that we're both trying to achieve the same thing, or all five of us, or how many. And then of course, we need to have our skills integrated. We need to be able to figure out where we fit and how we work with one another. Um, and that common goal and open communication leads to mutual trust, progress, a sense of unity, and of course, through a holistic focus, and this is where I really, really love what Jeff did differently. We had talked about people getting aligned around mutual interest and goals and objectives, but the idea of a collective ambition is a really, really powerful force because as an ambition, it's a driving energy. It's not just a thought. It's not just an agreement or a decision. It's a driving ambition. And if we share that as a collective ambition, then we can be immensely successful. And that's what I'm looking to do here with the Team Flow Institute is establish and get more clearly defined than it is today, because I know it's not yet, um, to establish what that collective ambition is and get moving together in that same direction. Uh, and knowing what we know about community development over the years, you know, I'm not expecting everyone to be in this sort of inner circle doing this, but our hope and our work right now is to attract the top leading thinkers around the world in the future of work and AI and augmenting collaboration 
and to bring them together under this roof to perform research, to, to build experiments, to try safe fail small pilot projects and, and different rituals and different situations and ultimately build a more detailed map for how we can better collaborate with one another in remote and distributed teams. And that, that is really the, the, the biggest collective ambition is how do we map that? so that individuals who are leading teams are doing these efforts and, and ultimately the team flow facilitator will know which decision-making tools, will know which uh, AI summarization tools, will know where to get the information that's needed and will be able to implement these protocols in such a way that leads to greater cohesion and leads to that state of flow. If I can add one thing to that. Please. Um, before jumping into actually that page. Um, this sense of individual flow, and I know that we all kind of understand at least the theory, if not experiencing it for ourselves, how individual flow works. There's a lot of setup that you have to do for yourself to find collective alignment of all the things that you as a human need in yourself, in your, um, in your soul, in your consciousness, in your unconsciousness that all have to align for the chance of flow, the state of flow to emerge in yourself. So that analogy here is where I think it's interesting to kind of relook at this, this collective ambition. It's all that alignment of all the different team members, all in the same frame of mind with the same wants and needs and capabilities, thanks to a lot of the tool sets that we have here, to create that team flow. Team flow and flow are not the same. The closest we found in the world before work got into this was jazz and basketball where you just have everybody is aligned in the exact same way. And that alignment, whether it's in yourself or collectively together as a team, that's where these two things are exactly the same. And that really sets up very nicely um, some of our background. I mentioned a little bit about aligned and uh, what, I, what I did and how that led me to alignment and whole different way to create a system of accountability and so much more. Well, Jamie was working on another aspect of this and uh, Jamie, why don't you tell us a little bit more about what you were doing with Send Thanks and how that relates to TeamFlow? Sure. So um, it's, instead of the word trust before, I'm going to use another word, gratitude. Uh, there are all these kinds of things that we've discovered that throughout our different careers uh, play into this connection, play into this natural connection between human beings. Gratitude is one of the strongest ones that are out there. When COVID hit, um, I was with a team that was able to access a database of 5,000 essential workers. Our goal there was to start just telling their stories and allowing people to learn about these essential workers through their personal stories and be able to send them thank you notes. We had a tokenized solution. A heart was worth a penny. So it wasn't a big deal. It was a stamp to get your message there. But if you wanted to send 500 hearts, hey, that's a cup of coffee, 2,000 hearts, that's a cab ride home, whatever it may be. But the connection that's made over gratitude, I see you, I recognize what you've done, and I want you to feel that sense of gratitude that I have for you and to transfer that feeling that I have in me to a feeling that I want you to have. So that um, the last mechanic that was important here was that you could not cash out the hearts if you were a receiver of them in general, because we wanted to get everybody on the platform. Once you thank somebody, you were on the platform too. So everybody can thank anyone anywhere, anytime for anything and make it habitual. Um, but you couldn't cash out if you weren't an essential worker, which meant that if I thanked Chris for something, what I was giving him was the value of gratitude and knowing that that would pass on eventually to an essential worker who would be able to cash out, gave this own gratitude value, a token that held the value beyond a monetary point to it. And that opened up doors even wider in terms of how people were using the hearts and understanding the specific value of that. So there's a tokenized system built into what we're doing that plays into that as well. And gratitude is one of a number of those kinds of very human things that get to the difference between business as usual versus business as possible. And that one last note that I want to say before I actually have to go, because the patents that Chris was mentioning, I've got another one to file before end of day with my patent attorney, or I lose the right on this PCT. So the last thing that I'll say is in business as usual, the way work has worked up till now is there are tools that we give our workers, 
But if you look at enterprises, we look at humans as tools as well. Every single time we've given people some sort of CSR, some sort of like meals or the foosball table, whatever it is, it's to shut up the human in you so that you can get back to being the input output machine, just like the tools that we give you. If you apply AI to that, what Chris was getting on about before, about just throwing AI into a system that's business as usual, you will get that systems collapse because you are now still treating a human as a tool and AI can take over those parts eventually. You're setting up a system of incentivization to further extract more and more of the human out of it. And this being that last moment before the incentivization structure becomes too hard. If you actually invert the pyramid of support from leaders at the top to leaders at the bottom being supportive of the team before instituting AI, that's one of the reasons why we think this is important to do right now before AI gets into the DNA of everything and either creates that system collapse or offers a way forward with something like this. So those are my two cents and I'm sorry to leave everybody so soon, but I'm very much looking forward to greeting everybody one-on-one -on -one and getting to know everybody and seeing what kind of flow we can all create. Thank you so much, Jamie, appreciate it. Um, for, further to this, um, I've been working with Michael Moon now for a number of years and uh, last two years, he had been building a Waymakers community for change agents, essentially. And so there's a huge amount of the past couple of years of masterminds and, and meetings and looking at literally almost all of, of Michael's life work, a part of which was gratitude games um, and understanding the power of gratitude to create cohesion and connection. And really, again, getting into that positive psychology component, which is very much aligned with team flow and the concepts of flow itself. Um, but there's another part of that as well, which is what I was trying to do with Aligned ultimately, was creating a real-time performance management system to recognize uh, contributions and skills. And uh, I'm not gonna go much further into that right now, other than to say that when we first started working on this about a year ago, um, we were calling it gratitude and glory. And, and thought that those two components were the accelerant of team flow. And of course, that's sort of, you know, everything looks like a hammer and a nail to a carpenter sort of thing where Jamie's coming in from his background and I'm coming in with this one. Um, but together, the collision of these ideas is what led us to all these breakthroughs and finding a better way uh, to frame and make uh, these changes a little more approachable and also to make them safer for people to implement and try. And we've got a bunch of that coming up, some of which I'm gonna start introducing to you now. Um, team flow and remote work. Uh, well, just to kind of put it into context and, and doing it simply, we've talked about this, changing how we work, not just where, most of this stuff you know, um, but the shared goals, unity and mutual trust is what we're really trying to facilitate. That's what we should always be trying to facilitate. So I've had a couple of people say to me, well, aren't you just talking about best practices or something like that? And I think in many ways we are, but we're putting it within this rubric with the broader goal of a state of being um, for us to achieve together that also gives us a common language for most everyday people, whatever level reading skill or whatever they're on, to be able to join us in this pursuit together, to understand why it's good for them, to understand why it's good for us. And um, I think really the other thing besides this being important for human work uh, is a, a hurdle that we have, which is the hurdle of the meta work, right? We look at all that preparation work and everything all too often as extra work that's not needed. But as I've always found, measure twice, cut once, let's plan. Let's get our stuff done ahead of time. And if we can orchestrate it and plan it in advance and think through you know, the future success scenarios as well as future failure scenarios, um, we can accommodate those and, and work to achieve what we want and avoid what we don't. But it takes that meta work. And so right now with the switch to remote, what really happened was that no one had time to do all that work. Even if companies and leaders in companies before were preparing agendas for every meeting, were actually getting everyone prepared and having everyone do the work. Um, because of all the chaos and, and uncertainty and fear we had in our lives uh, during COVID and the rest of it, all that meta work was not getting done to the level it needed to be. Um, and there's a whole bunch more about that, but we'll get to that in a minute. So now we need to really invest in 
changing how we interact with each other with intention and with clarity. So we'll get there. I know we will. So the potential to transform team dynamics and performance, well, what does it produce? Uh, enhanced collaboration, very simply. That's what we're looking for. Uh, increased productivity, right? Well, what does productivity mean? It, that's a, a whole different course we're not going to get into too much. But even Drucker, uh, Peter Drucker, in some of his early treatises on, on productivity, had a lot to say about this and the differences uh, in knowledge work compared to industrial manufacturing work, right? When we were actually able to measure widget production as our measure of success, where that's not is possible to be measured, creativity, innovation, how do we measure that? We used proxies for that, and we'll be talking about that quite a bit more. Um, but we believe that by seeing the flow of gratitude and recognition inside the organization, that's one measure that'll give us an understanding into the sorts of progress that a team is able to make and the cohesion that they have. Um, what we're also looking at is a lot of improved job satisfaction, so improvements to retention. Um, of course, then there's also improvements to recruitment, because if somebody goes, um, you know, how is it working on your team with your company? If you're saying, no, it sucks, um, you know, the damage to that employer brand is, is pretty, pretty severe. And a lot of people are out saying that right now, because unfortunately, they're not having great experiences. And this is actually where I, I have to turn to Seth Godin's new book, which I'm intending to be our, our book of the month, as I said just before we started, um, which talks about the idea of giving an employee, or in my mind, an independent contractor, freelancer, fractional exec, anyone else working on our team, to actually, to actually give them the most wonderful, the greatest job ever that they could have ever had. And if we're striving for that, um, that, again, is aligned with the idea of getting well-being for our people. So, where to start? Well, I've got some simple things here because we really want to just get started now and we'd like to see everyone get started. Um, first of all, uh, the growth mindset. Uh, you know, this is something in HR that's just kind of taken on as a hiring trait, that the, the, the larger corporations are identified, that that's what they're really gearing to look for, and particularly uh, younger talent. Um, but we believe you can also just simply start expressing gratitude for the contributions and skills of your people. Um, and how do we actually recognize that, the acknowledgement when somebody shows up and does something that's really there, that the public acknowledgement of that is a really great way and a very simple way to kind of get this started and start seeing the changes on the team that happen with us. The other thing is that, as you've probably all experienced, and we did hear a little bit even at the beginning, although I, I kept it on time to start at, you know, before five after, um, we often will spend our time in the front part of an hour meeting where it could be 10 to 20 minutes of connections, catching up, socializing, doing all that other stuff. And the reality is, is we just don't have, we don't have the ability to invest all of that extra time in that way when we've only allocated an hour for us to get together to achieve something, to make a decision, to make progress, to create greater understanding, to actually be creative. Um, we need all of that time and, and indeed more. Um, the other thing that's really important and very simple is embracing working out loud instead of inside emails and DMs. Um, by that, I mean not only inside of a Slack or a Discord channel or Teams or whatever it is that you're using for real-time uh, organizational chat, uh, but it also means uh, going into something like Notion or even Google Docs or any of the other sort of stand-ups where we can create a single source of truth, which is, you know, what we used to call intranets, <laughs> sadly enough, back in the day. Uh, but uh, to have that, to have that employee handbook, to have that sort of gateway, that dashboard to all the different work functions that are inside of it. Um, the other thing here, very simple: don't go to a remote meeting if there's not an agenda. Uh, if the person calling it hasn't established one, even if it's just the three bullet points they send. Uh, in advance, let's get that agenda, let's get clarity, and then let's move forward on what we need to accomplish together, as opposed to just letting it unravel. The other thing that's really important here is not only getting a sense of, 
of uh, flow and what that feels like, but to develop deeper knowledge of yourself so that you can better understand your teams and that you can go further than that. That's one of the reasons why I've partnered with my dear friend, um, John Estefanos out of Rally Bright, and we are integrating some of his team assessment tools into this process so that we can build a baseline of where are we starting from and use that to simply diagnose uh, you know, cultural and other interpersonal challenges that the team might be experiencing. And then of course, the, the big one that I've mentioned several times here is if you're not already using an AI transcription service in your meetings to facilitate greater clarity, alignment and trust building. Um, there are some challenges with that because there are things that we don't want on the record sometime. So it has to be managed properly. Again, that's perhaps the role of the team flow facilitator, whoever wears that hat. Um, but it is something that we have to be mindful of. And it is also something that I found uh, leads to more positive and productive conversations when we don't want to say something really shitty about somebody not on the call. So there's actually probably some positive dynamics inside of that as well at the end of the day. Um, but we do need to manage it and it needs to be adaptable. That's why I really believe most people don't like this concept of best practices because they believe it to be a template of something that you follow by rote. Whereas I think of best practices as a set of principles that we need to adapt to the unique contours of every situation. And really that's what I'm talking about with the mission for the Team Flow Institute is try to figure out how to map those contours so we can identify which decision-making protocol, which intervention, which regular rituals are gonna be the ones that actually support the team coming together because there is no team that is like just another team, unless it's got the same members and the same purpose and the same ecosystem or market. And that's uh, obviously not often the case. So um, where do we really start? Uh, I really, really love, and we landed on a really interesting thing here with Simon Sinek's Golden Circle. Uh, of course, he wrote, start with why, and this is an uh, outgrowth of that. He now calls it the Golden Circle and uh, why, how, what? Pretty straightforward, right? Well, we're wanting to add on to that a little bit and take this a step further for the organization and for the team. And where we go from here to break free from the chains of our past um, is the development of a culture plan. It's not just the why, how, what, but it's also the who. And the why being the heart of our organization, our mission, vision, values. Why do we exist? What are we doing here together? The how being the workflows and workspaces the protocols for actually how we collaborate, how we set meetings and the rest of it. The what being what we're trying to accomplish, the, the strategies we're working to enact and the objectives we're trying to manifest and make real into the world. And then ultimately, who being the work agreements that we establish one another when something is due to me from someone else and how we actually go about moving a project down the line from you know, the initial start to completion we're into standing it up as an ongoing program. Who are the people we need to work with in order to make that happen? And that's where the co-elevation strategy really comes in. And that's where the culture plan really sits at the intersection of the strategic plan and the operational plan in order to make it more effective because we've intentionally co-designed it to accomplish those goals, understanding the people who are within the system itself and who need to do it. Um, so, uh, as we start moving here towards the end, and look at that, 15 minutes as planned, that's a miracle for me, if you don't know me, uh, very happy to be able to do that. Um, you know, this is where we want you to join us, and you already have, so thank you so very much for, for doing that. Um, we're holding conversations in Discord regularly. I have had some concerns about are we going to be able to get everyone in Discord. I think we can move through that. I'll probably need to do some more work on onboarding videos and fixing some things my programmer had set up that don't seem to be working the way I'd like them to right now. Um, but we want to keep it to be a, a community with real humans. So that's why we put all the capture bots on the front end and verify yourself and stuff like that, because uh, we will uh, soon be opening it up for people to join the community straight from Discord and from straight discovery. Um, for now, we're trying to gate it through the free website membership. 
uh, just so that we've got that validation and that we can have a conversation together and I can see who's really joining as opposed to, you know, whatever the handles might be in Discord. Um, but that still is potentially to evolve and it's something that I'm happy to explore together in terms of how do we make it better um, for all of our mutual benefit. The other thing is, you know, finding ways to take on some of these little ideas and small little interventions or actions and and try them, try them with your team, see what sort of feedback we get and come back and discuss them with us in our office hours or in the Discord channel or write a post up about it and we'll help you feature it and get some exposure to it. And ultimately building a collective knowledge base together, uh, something else we'll talk about in a later uh, sort of uh, office hour seminar or something else. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, sign up for the fall course. It's not offered yet entirely. I've got a really fantastic structure for this. As I was going through the various white papers that we wanted to teach to and some of these other concepts that were, you know, originating ourselves, uh, it really, it really struck me that this could be a chance more than just to learn, but to create. And that the kind of class assignments or the, the weekly assignment, if you will, or monthly assignment, depending on the, the scope, is about actually figuring out how to take this mainstream. What are the ways to talk about this in a better way to encourage more project managers, COOs, and team leaders to explore team flow and contribute to our growing body of knowledge to help other people with it? Um, the other bit behind it is, of course, all of those sorts of experiments inside of it and how we can actually figure out what works. And then a larger research project to actually map that directly uh, to these different situations uh, as we start getting to scale. And then of course, uh, what's really important if you haven't had it yet and, and you haven't been there is to find your own state of flow, to experience it, try to get there often. Uh, another important work if you're not familiar with it is actually deep work. Uh, by Cal Newport, uh, very much related to this in case you were wondering or thinking about that earlier. And so there's a tremendous body of work that's out there already. I think what we need to do now is, is make it more accessible to more people, make it more practical, and connect it to the sorts of benefits that COOs and project managers and those sorts of people who keep the trains running on time care about. Um, so we're going to be working hard on that over the coming uh, weeks and months, and I do believe years ahead based on the uh, initial um, feedback that we've gotten and the need for this sort of work. Um, so with that, um, thank you for letting me ramble on for 45 minutes and share some of what we've been working on with you. Uh, there's a great deal more, obviously. It was very difficult to try to get something simple for this first one. Uh, I hope that I've been able to convey some of our deeper insights, as well as give you a flavor for the direction we're heading and the sorts of work that we're doing. And uh, I thank you very much again for joining. Um, I'm going to open it up basically for a, a full discussion and take this slide down and happy to answer your questions or, or hear from some of your contributions. Woo! I'm, I'm super excited to see what you where you're playing at with the AI integrations into meeting, because where we're working at is AI integrations into open story, which has mm. some very similar like writer's room collaboration type of uh, structures. So I was really keen on kind of seeing how this flow could be achieved, you know, within our industry as well, because that's really at the core of trying to get to creativity and creative mind space is really sitting in that flow space. And it's really, really hard to write when you're in a downward facing dog, no jokes intended, but that's really the only kind of true flow state I've ever been <laughs> able to kind of work myself into. And I, I know how to do it and I'm poor, my, my practice is bad, right? So this larger think of collectively how we could work together in a flow state is very compelling. Oh, that's great, John. Yeah, I, I believe very, very much so. But, but to your point, well, two things. First of all, um, having poor posture and sun salutations uh, doesn't uh, negate from the fact that you're following and letting your body be where it is. Um, you know, and in fact, as I was looking at um, the logo concepts and stuff and what we were going to do, 
the one that really hit me that I wanted to do was the um, Japanese ancien, uh, you know, the imperfect circle, because we are, as a team, going to be imperfectly flowing. It's never going to be exactly perfect. We're always going to be looking to make it a little better and make those adjustments, which is where, again, I see the importance of a team flow facilitator slash coach to, like, put the butt down a little bit more so that the pelvis is tilted the right, the right way. And how do we make these small adjustments as we're going on collaborating with one another? How does somebody actually pay attention to the fact that these two people, there's something unsaid between them that's really causing something weird. And instead of ignoring it and just letting it happen, being able to talk to one of them about it and find a way to get resolution on those things so that we can get back in the flow. So, you know, the, the economic dynamics perhaps change in a sort of co-writing relationship, of course, um, but I do believe that there are ways to do it. And um, I wasn't going to talk about this, but as long as we're on it, uh, we have a, a vision for a team flow bot um, that is an augmenting bot that will serve as a support person to the team flow facilitator. Uh, triggers for when to say things, when to do things, when to wrap up meetings, of course, feeding in some stuff from prior meetings, and really just having somebody there as a pilot to be able to, when somebody says, oh, I forgot, what did we do on that? Or what did we agree? Go back to the decision journal or go back to the record of the meeting notes and be able to instantly pull that up and say, no, so-and-so said this, here's a link to it, and that's what we agreed to do. Right. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things in there that are needed like that, but there's also all these new behaviors that are now accessible because of the AI. Now, the last thing on the AI is how I envision that within Team Flow Institute and what we're doing is that we're looking to tokenize the knowledge contributions of members of the community so that we ultimately all co own the large language model that we build specifically for Team Flow facilitation. So like I said, I got like I got there's so much more too, but let's let, that's that's out away. So that's why I put the roadmap up on the site. First thing, build a community of practice. Second thing, get a new organization stood up, a new structure for that with some funding. And then third thing, how do we really mainstream this and how do we build those other technologies? Yeah, we I mean, as far as like building our own service layer and AI, we've made some attempts, but we actually have had more success creating a comedy bot and some other things like that where we can play around with the, the tools where they're more like a collaborator in the room as well, which is very interesting from a dynamic I think we're going to see a lot more of. And I think it'll be a hell of a lot more than a, I think it'll be a fleet of AIs before we know it. Hey, um, thank you very much, John. I appreciate it. It's really good to see you. Philip, I see your uh, challenge with getting the Discord worked properly. I will fix that for you. Uh, that, that's very easy for me to fix here. Again, there's some uh, weird it, stuff it. in the setup. Perfect. That would be lovely. Thank you. I'd like to jump in on that. I, I, I just want to say while I'm, while I'm unmuted that uh, uh, there is absolutely nothing to dislike about the Team Flow Institute. I've tried to find something. I can't find anything. You know, Brits. <laughs> Brits like to find something to dislike. Seriously. But damn, I couldn't spot anything. Uh, I think perhaps the the challenge, as far as I can see, is distinguishing this from everything that's come before in a tangible way. We can maybe sense it because we've been working in this space for a while, but for everyone else whose expertise lies elsewhere, then they'll want some kind of tangible evidence that where we're going is both new and likely to succeed and the risk i think will be walking the line between looking like we're not doing anything different and then the techno solutionist hey we've got some ai shit going down here and you can abdicate your agency to the ai and the ai will guide you and you can lose your humanity but pick your brain up on the way out uh, which is which is uh, which is obviously is counterfeitical to everybody's reason for being on this Zoom today, but that's I think and I don't I don't you didn't present Team Flow Institute as being all about the AI absolutely not, but guess what's big in twenty twenty three, 
In fact, if you've got any business and can just register the .ai domain, you probably just 10 x your, your market cap, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's ridiculously hyped up at the moment. And I believe that there will be an undervaluing of people who approach that AI augmentation from a human-centric or life-centric perspective in the short term, but in the longer term, those who don't come at it in, dare I say, sort of an Elon Musk sort of techno solutionist way will win out. I got at least I hope so. Yeah, and I believe that there are enough of us who understand that, um, that uh, the coming together, the, the, the joining of this behind this is really important. And in fact, um, really trying to balance the AI with what this is as whether or not does it lead the spear, is it the tip of the spear or is it part of it? You know, that was a month of just trying to sort through how do we do this and testing it out and really landed on that the um, business is possible is really like the narrative. And that's actually the narrative we really wanted to launch with. But then I realized it didn't introduce team flow. So this month, we're going to be talking a lot about team flow. Then we'll go into some of the bigger stuff and, you know, get more involved with AI conversations around augmented humanity and bring together people for it. Part of the hope here again is that as a co-op, a lot of those AI companies can be a part of this and they can join and, and participate and contribute and get ideas from our community and build stuff with us and the rest. But more importantly, to stand behind the design philosophy and approach. Um, you know, I was involved with John Hagel and uh, John Seeley Brown's mm -hmm. Disrupting Unemployment down there with David Nordforce for a while. And this was going back also 2014-ish. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've been thinking about this for way long time and there's still not the safeguards in place for us. So we need to continue to have that conversation while we're creating value with each other. And uh, uh, Philip, I'm just so glad to have you here with us. Thank you so much for your kind words. I really. Uh...